I'm looking. Oh yeah, now you see it there's it's a little... See, it's not too deep. Sorry, I was about to trip and I couldn't see where I was going. Thank you. I guess it's not that deep. You can come into this area if you want. So, if the coronavirus wasn't around, we'd be taking a boat? Uh, the boat ride section is in like actually like seven feet of water. It's further down. It's at like oh. the very end of the tour. So, where, where we'll end the tour is right where the boat ride, where we normally get on that. Oh. But, uh, so right here in this section, uh, this is where I like to talk about like how this cave was constructed. So, again, like, this is not a natural cave formation. This is all man-made, made in the mid-1850s through 1860s. So they're going to run into like the same problems as the building of the canal. They don't have the modern day tools or electricity to make this an easy job. Uh, very difficult job, very physically demanding. Men came down here every day and they split up into teams of two. Uh, now that they're split up, I imagine they're going to draw straws or rock, paper, scissors or like, you know, something to figure out who got the bad job and who got well, the really bad job. It wasn't really a good job down here. But uh, the better of the two jobs, the one that I suppose they'd want to have, would be the one holding this right here. And this is just a hammer, iron sledgehammer, nothing all too special about it. But the really bad job, the one they do not want, is the one holding this. Uh, a large drill bit, it was called a star point or a ball point, had a star-shaped point at the end of it. So they grabbed their tools, One's going to hold the star point up into the side of the wall. Oh. The other one takes the hammer and the process begins. It went hit, turn, hit, turn, hit, turn, and they did that for about an hour and a half at a time. Uh, so, I mean, you can tell why holding the drill bit was the, the worst of the two jobs. They were swinging this hammer as hard as they possibly could for an hour and a half at a time. So you're bound to like miss once or twice and whack the other guy on the arm. with it. Yeah, that, that's not going to feel very good. So yeah, an hour and a half of that, hitting and turning. After that time, they're not going to be left with a whole lot to show for all that effort they just put in. Uh, all you really have now is a little hole around that size right there. Same with, same with the drill bit, only a couple of inches deep. But now that you have that hole made, this is when they call in what's known as the powder monkeys. <laughs> and yeah, powder monkey is kind of a silly word, but it's really just describing the kids that work down here in the cave. Oh. Uh, so yeah, kids between the ages of 8 to 12 work down here. And That's sad. Their job was that once that hole is made, they go over to it. They're going to stuff it full of black powder as tight as they can, put a wick or a fuse in it, they light it, and they run. You run away as fast as you can in the opposite direction. That's horrible. And boom, the explosion goes off. Uh, when they come back now after that, what you're going to be left with is a hole around the size of like a volleyball. Volleyball at the basketball size range hole. And that's how this entire cave was built over the course of eight years. Uh, volleyball wow. size hole after volleyball size hole. <laughs> yeah, did so it, when, did when the kids they, ever die? Did the kids ever or die? Or get hurt? So, here's the thing. Um, I get a lot of a lot of questions along this of like how many people died or how many people got like injured or any of that in the cave, and I really don't have much to go off. Uh, I don't really have a lot to tell you guys. All I know is that there was a reported two deaths to take place in this cave. Uh, mm -hmm. The key word in that is reported. A lot of these deaths or injuries down here were not reported for. Uh, a lot of a, di a lot of different reasons. I'll kind of go over that, but uh, you know, the first thing I heard, well, the first thing I thought of when I heard that kids did this job at, at the powder monkeys with the black powder is like, well, first off, why? Uh, why would you give kids basically dynamite and then just set them loose down here in the cave? Kind of seems uh, a little bit off. Uh, but there was a bunch of reasons behind it. Not that they're good reasons. 
Um, some of the more obvious ones are, you know, kids are a lot faster, they can run faster, they can run away from that explosion. They're smaller so they can squeeze through like the tiny openings in here when they're first building the cave. Uh, they get up a lot quicker if they happen to fall down while running away from the explosion. Cheap labor, you don't really have to pay the kids much of anything. But like a big reason is that most of these powder monkeys were orphans. So mm -hmm. if one of them didn't make it away from that explosion, they got injured or killed down here, no one's going to come around asking questions about what happened to them. That's horrible. Um, yeah, it's really horrible, but like it, the, em the employers of this cave, you know, they've invested a lot of money. They have these factories that they're scheduled to, to open up up there, but they cannot open the factory until this cave is done and they let the water start run, running through it. They can't stop building this cave for anything. Like right? they want this cave up and running as soon as possible so they can start making their money. So they can't afford to be able to have to keep shutting down the cave from, from work every time that someone gets injured or killed down here. So they do a lot of tactics that will go over to not have to report a lot of these injuries or deaths that take, take place in the cave. And that's kind of why we only come to two reported deaths in the cave. So none of those powder monkeys, if they were injured or anything down here, probably would have been reported because most of them were orphans. No one even knew they were down here in the first place. Uh, but. Some other things I can point out right here in this area that have to do with the construction of this cave is this right up above us. So this right here, it kind of looks like a stalactite. It is in a way, but it's not like 100% true stalactite. There's some other like real stalactites right around here, but they're all pretty tiny. So like these two right here, there's some more right here. Uh, yeah, some of them are right there. As you can notice, these stalactites are pretty small. They're not like the stalactites you envision when you like when you see like a movie or a, like a TV show, something like that. And that's mostly because well, stalactites they take a while to grow. Uh, so they grow at the rate of about one inch per every hundred years. This cave, it's not even two hundred years old yet. So most of the stalactites down here are really only around like an inch and a half long. None of them should be any longer than two inches. Uh, this one right here, it's only that big because it's growing around a metal rod that's coming out of the ceiling. And that metal rod, it's called a surveyor's monument. It had a very important role down here at keeping these miners on track while they were building the cave. So if I find them where another one was, I can describe it a lot better. Here we go. So here's where another surveyor's monument uh, another surveyor's monument would have been. The metal rod itself is gone, but you can still see the hole left from it. So uh, imagine you're a miner down here building the cave. You're going to run into a problem real fast. And that problem is you have no clue where you are in relation to the outside world. And if you don't know where you are, you don't know which way to keep building the cave. Do you keep building it straight, go to the left, the right? Uh, they have no clue because they don't know where they are. So another, uh, another job would have been up on the surface. A couple men would scout out the area and then drill down to where center of the cave should continue going. So if we looked at where they placed this one, you can see that it's basically exactly in the center here. So that tells the miners to keep building straight ahead, keep that as the center of the cave as they build it. So they build that, everything center with that mark, until you get to here. And now the new surveyor's monument is closer to the left side than it is the right. So this is telling the miners now that the center of the cave needs to start ending, it needs to end up over there as they keep building the cave ahead. So if you follow this straight ahead, you can actually see that now the center, yeah, it's right there, which effectively means the cave curves to the left. Uh, the reason why it needs to curve to the left right here is because this cave, it follows that hillside. It's built into the hillside that we're walking along. And that hillside <coughs> after this point, it starts to curve to the left it ends right through that wall right there. So if they had never built their surveyor's monument, uh, the miners, they wouldn't know any better. They would just keep building straight ahead. They would have blasted right through to the outside. The entire cave would have been ruined. It's like seven years of work up to this point, all for nothing. But because of it, they were able to keep the cave all in one piece and they were able to, you know, be able to keep, uh, keep building the right way. So uh, before we move on here, guys, there's actually one more thing I can do in this area. I won't do it if anyone feels uncomfortable with it, but anyone interested in finding out just how dark it could get down here if I was trying to follow the lights for a couple seconds? Yes. All right. So again, in the mid 1850s, there was no electricity down here. They have no flashlights, uh, cell phones, batteries, any easy, convenient way to make light. 
they had kerosene lanterns. So if one of those lanterns gets knocked over or goes out for whatever reason, uh, what's going to happen real fast down here is that. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> pretty, pretty dark. Yeah, exactly. How do you light another lantern like this? It's like, where do you leave the matches? Oh, it's over by the black powder, and then boom. So uh, you know, the point I'm trying to make here is just don't knock over your only source of light. <laughs> I am. I am. I thought that when they said um the about the surveillance or whatever. The whole, I thought they were making sure that they were working. No, severe. Yeah, no, severe. Not severe. I know, but I thought. A severe is somebody who snaps that up. Oh. That's really dark. Yeah. Huh? I don't. I don't it was the dark, the things weren't dark enough. It wasn't dark enough for too long, but I was gonna slowly walk towards, like, tor I was gonna slowly walk back, and you're gonna be like, how'd you get over there? Huh? Why? Well, that's why I was walking slowly. Oh yeah, thank you. Oh wow, that's a... What? Oh, it's leaking. What's this? Is that a cauldron? Now, I could try to make something up about it and say that it has some historical significance that it like, carried the black powder or something like that, but that would just be a lie. There's actually no historical significance behind this cauldron whatsoever. It's just a prop for our Halloween tours that we, that we run down here in October. Uh, so what's it doing here right now? We're not just getting ready for Halloween or anything like that. It's actually always down here uh, around the clock. Uh, this is kind of a funny story behind it. So a couple of years ago, a few of the tour guides came down here to build it. And they were basically given one job. It was to make this thing light enough so that it could be carried out of here at the end of the season. And uh, I mean, honestly, they did a really good job at that. It's extremely light. That's not the issue. Uh, the issue occurred when they went to go carry it out of here, and they found out it's too big to fit through the door. Uh, so it's actually just stuck down here forever. They followed their job to the T. They made it light, but no one ever told them to make it small enough to fit through the door. So, you know, it's not their fault. It's just down here forever now, one last thing to carry here down, down during Halloween. Uh, but what I do like to talk about here that does have more like historical significance to this place is a little bit more about the miners or the men that built the cave. So this cave was constructed mostly by Irish immigrants, Irish, also some Italian, mostly who settled in this area at the time. And they worked down here for 12 hours a day. What? So 12 hour shifts, and they actually only made about two cents an hour for all their hard work. Oh, wow. So at the end of your 12 hour day, they only went home with like a whopping 24 cents, not even a quarter a day, uh, which was pretty bad. I mean, even back then, that was barely considered like a livable wage. You know, they're just barely scraping by trying for to- For all that work. Better. Hmm? I said for all that work. Yeah, for all that work, they're basically getting nothing for it. But there, there was another <laughs> benefit, I guess. Uh, there's also some reports that these miners were given like a shot of whiskey every like hour and a half, two hours to help keep them motivated. Oh but my God. It, it's not really to keep them motivated. Like, it's just another one of the tactics that the employers would use to kind of like keep this, this place on schedule. So if one of those miners gets injured or killed down here working, 
Uh, because they were jerking on the job, you didn't really have to report that either. It wasn't the fault of the management that uh, your employees were being unsafe while at work, even though you were the one supplying them with the whiskey. So again, they just get off scot-free and they just keep building this place like nothing, nothing ever happened. So there's another tactic they could use to like not have to report anything that went on down here. Uh, so yeah, the 24 cents a day, not good. These miners, they needed to figure out a way of how to make some extra money on the side so they'd be able to like support their families. And some of them were pretty clever. They found out a really, a really good way to make some extra money. And that was with the use of this white stone right here. So this white stone, it's called gypsum. And gypsum, it's not extremely valuable or anything like that, but there is tons of it all throughout the state. So all these little white specks of rock here, this is all gypsum. We've been walking by it this like, whole time. But now that I pointed it out, you'll start to see it everywhere. It's just, yeah, it's littered all along uh, the rock in here. Uh, so gypsum in the mid-1850s, like completely worthless. It had no value whatsoever. Nowadays, it's used in like chalk, drywall, sheet rock, things like that. So it has some value. Uh, but back then, since it was so worthless, the miners were given permission to take it home with them at the end of their days. So they would take home the gypsum, they give it to their wives, their wives polish it up, make it look round, smooth, shiny, all that, and then they take all that gypsum to Niagara Falls. So where we are here in Lockport, we're pretty close to the falls, it wasn't all that difficult for them to get there. But if you wanted to go see the falls back then and you didn't live close by, it meant that you had to be really wealthy in order to make that journey there. So when the, when the wives get to the falls, they look around for those wealthy travelers, they're gonna approach one, they present them the gypsum, and then say something probably along the lines of, uh, my husband and I, we just discovered a way to condense the mist of the falls into this stone right here. Would you like to buy some of the condensed mist of Niagara Falls? Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, basically it was just a really big scam. And honestly, it doesn't even sound like that good of one, like who would ever fall for that? But you'd be surprised. A lot of people fell for that scam. Uh, they would sell that little worthless lump of gypsum for a dollar a piece. So even if you only managed to sell one of them, you just made four days of your husband's wages. And if you start to sell more than one in a day, like a couple, maybe five, I mean, now you're making more money selling the gypsum than your husbands will ever make working down here. So yeah, really, really good scam. Uh, you know, easy way to make some money. And I should probably be selling it myself. <laughs> I actually think they do still sell it at uh, Niagara Falls in some of the gift shops there. Along with Niagara Falls. Along with them, yeah. I wonder if they have any originals in the museum. Hmm? I want. Yeah. That'd be cool to have. Condensed, fake condensed mist. From back in the day. I'm sweating. I don't know why. So, oh. uh, at this point, we have now backtracked all the way back to the second factory we saw on the outside of the Richmond Manufacturing Company. So, right where I said to remember when that penstock pipe was coming out of the hillside of Richmond, that's where we are. Uh, the pipe itself has been removed, but you can still see that path would have taken right back out there where we saw it. Uh, also, right above us right here, you might notice a little bit more drips coming from the ceiling right here. And that's because this wooden trap door is covering up what used to be an air ventilation shaft for the cave. Uh, so it got extremely difficult to breathe down here, as you might imagine. There was blast with black powder all day, so there's smoke in the air, there's rock debris, dust, all of that. So they did build a couple of air shafts. And by a couple, I mean there's literally two of them. There's uh -huh. this one right here, and there's another one a little bit further down in the boat rise section. Unfortunately, you won't be able to see that one today. But yeah, uh, just the two vent shafts for this entire cave that's almost a half mile long. So uh, I doubt they were really doing much, and I really doubt they were actually designed to do much. So, you know, from what I've, I've kind of figured out from learning about all this, 
it doesn't really seem like the employers in this case care about the employees down here whatsoever. They don't care about their health. They don't really care if they can't breathe all that well. They're still going to, you know, as long as they can still work. What I think of these air shaft report was not to clear the air so they could breathe, but rather clear the air so they would be able to see. Because if your, if your workers can't breathe down here, then they can still work. But if they can't see what they're doing, then no work's going to be getting done. So they had to build these air shafts just to allow the, the miners to be able to see a little bit better so they could continue building the cave. If they happen to be able to breathe a little bit better after that, then whatever. But that's, that's not what the original goal was here. Uh, so we're going to keep on moving along, guys. Our next stop will actually be our last stop. I'll stop us uh, right before like, where the, the dock where the dock is for the boat ride. I'll go over some of the stories that I would normally tell uh, on the boat ride. So. A little tight. So it's a little tight. Oh yeah, now I'm seeing all the white stone. Lockport 
one dollar for this entire cake. Yeah, a single dollar. Sounds kind of crazy, but like honestly, no one else was making any offers. The town doesn't want to spend millions of dollars filling it in, so they decided whatever, and they, they basically gave the, the cave away for, for a single dollar. Uh, the men who bought this place, they were a couple of engineers. They came down here, they see the cave is actually extremely stable, it's been compacting down on itself over the years, not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, so they spent a couple of years uh, putting in like the money and the time, uh, getting it ready for the public, getting it ready for tours, and we've been touring now ever since uh, 1991. So uh, invest in caves, they seem to be like a, you know, a great money-making opportunity, right? Uh, other than just the cave tours, we've also opened this place up to the film community. So we've actually had some TV shows and movies come down here to do some filming. Some of the more popular ones are the Sharknado movies. I don't know if anyone's aware of those, but basically they're like really kind of like silly sci-fi like action movies about sharks inside of tornadoes that go around <laughs> eating people. Uh, there are six of them now, I believe. Yeah, six of them. Uh, this game was filmed in for part of the second one in the series, and the name of that movie was the second one. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. uh, if you free spring that movie around the 45 minute mark, that's about like when they were filming down in our gate house, uh, they were actually so lazy that they never took the benches out of uh, their frame. And so if you freeze the movie at the right time, you can actually see like the benches in the gate house, like right, right in the background. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Tells you a lot about this movie right there. But uh, other than just Sharknado, we've also had the TV show Ghost Hunters. Oh, yeah. Uh, they came down in 2012. They locked themselves in overnight. They searched the cave for like any paranormal activity, anything like that. What's People that? always ask me, did they find anything? It's like, well, I mean, that's their job. Like, of course, they, they found something. Like, you know, like, they thought they, they heard some like voices or some like shadows moving around, something like that. I don't know about all that, but like, you know, honestly, I'm down here working in the cave alone by myself a lot of the time. And sometimes when you are the only person down here, you're, you know, you do start to hear some things or maybe see something. I don't really know if it's just my eyes playing tricks on me or what, but uh, and sometimes I, I think I hear like people like singing down here. I don't know if I'm just going crazy or if I'm just really uh, hungry and tired. But, uh, you know, you get some things that happen down here. A few tour guides over the years kind of leave because they just don't feel comfortable being down here and they think they see or hear something, they're gone forever. So, yeah, don't, don't know what's going on down here, but you know, there's always, always what's a chance. That? Hmm? What's that picture? Oh, this, uh, <laughs> there, was a, there was a picture, there's another one of that same picture over here on this side. I say it's a picture of my great great grandfather. So we're going to start to make our way out of the cave now, everyone. Uh, just be aware, we've been inside of like this dark area for a while, so just give your eyes a little bit of time to adjust the sunlight. If you have sunglasses, you might want to get them ready. Is this the picture? Yeah. Who is it, really? It's, it's no one. It's, it's not. Okay. Oh, no. Ooh. Is that part of the old? Yeah, that's part of the old pen stock right there. Ooh. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and thirteen. Look at that, a hundred percent return record. I still have never lost anybody. That, that's that's great for me. So at this point now, everyone, we've officially reached the end of the cave tour. So I want to thank everybody for coming out today. I hope you had a fun time, enjoyed yourself, maybe learned something along the way. Uh, if you did have fun, you felt like writing an online review later, once again, my name is Adam. Uh, if I'm terrible, I shouldn't be allowed out in public, I probably made up everything I said. Uh, then my name is Jeff, or you know, some, something. My name is Jeff. Yeah, my name is Jeff, you like that one? Exactly. <laughs> one out of ten people will get that reference. So this staircase right here, it'll lead you right back up to the office in the parking lot right where we started off. Once again, thank you very much for coming out, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Have a good one. Yeah. Did we just go down here? Uh, this there. All right. <laughs> that was fun.